Thank you all so much from, for, for in, introducing yourselves in the chat and welcome, welcome. We've got Brooklyn, Switzerland, Los Angeles, Honduras. It's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Keisha Nicole Knight, and I am the director of funds at the International Documentary Association, the IDA. And for our blind and low vision attendees, I'll just do a quick visual description. I'm a brown skinned woman wearing black rimmed glasses with short hair and a gray shirt in front of a blurred background. So I'm so excited to welcome you today to this Distribution 101 Teach Out. Distribution is a passion of mine and something that I really want to see us work toward making more accessible and available to independent filmmakers. And our guest today, Rachel Gordon, is an expert, I'll say, Rachel, in this field. And she's here to share um, knowledge with you and also take questions so we can think together around this and really start to kind of work through blind spots and, and things that are problematic. Um, so just, you know, really think about your questions throughout the session today. Um, I want to thank, before we start, Armando Zamudio, who is our um, running this event behind the scenes. You'll hear his voice from time to time. I also want to thank our access providers, Amanda Charles and Selena Flowers doing ASL interpretation, and also Kelly Labert doing live captions. And um, without further ado, I think that I'll just introduce Rachel and let her take it over. Um, so could please continue to introduce yourselves in the chat and um, I'll introduce Rachel. So Rachel Gordon has worked in the marketing and distribution of documentary films for two decades. In addition to grassroots outreach, she operated collective sales booths at conferences, giving independent filmmakers exposure at events that were too expensive to attend directly. And after interviewing over 150 producers and industry representatives, Rachel released the globally focused how-to book, the documentary distribution toolkit, how to get out, get seen, and get an audience. Rachel promotes documentary distribution education and has participated in webinars on preparing for the professional community through many different film festivals and events such as Doc NYC, Encounters South African International Documentary Film Festival, DWORD, CNEX, Chinese Documentary Forum, and MediMed, among many others. So you'll get to know Rachel today and um, looking forward to learning with you as well. So Rachel, without any further ado, I will pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Keisha. I'm really, I, hi everyone. I, I wanna begin by thanking you for being here and thank you uh, for responding to the optional questions about experience and what your questions were about distribution. And Keisha and Armando and Zafrin, thank you for having me. And the accessibility uh, experts are amazing. The responses that you provided let me know that some of you were new to the industry while others have made several projects. Oh, I should also mention that, um, I, sorry, I forgot to identify. Um, I am a Caucasian with ear length, short brown hair. I am wearing a purple oval glasses and a black background shirt with lots of colorful slip girls. Okay, my apologies for not doing that sooner. My goal is to help as many of you as I can today. This session is intended to provide you with as much useful and tangible information as possible. There will be time for questions twice. This was Keisha's brilliant idea. The first half is going to be about the current documentary landscape and defining the markets that program documentaries. A 15 minute Q&A will follow. Then the second half will focus on how to prepare for working with a distributor or sales agent, the technical deliverables to plan for and be aware of, and some professional advice before you venture out into the world of networking and pitching. 
I should also note, I've asked Keisha that if while I'm talking, since I'm reading text, if anything is unclear, that she interrupt me if I need to clarify. Just want everyone to be sure that they can follow. So I'm going to briefly introduce myself in a way that she hasn't already explained. I was a filmmaker who ventured into distribution to figure out how films got seen after watching all of my films go nowhere. Thankfully, I ended up working for the National Film Board of Canada in their New York office and learning about all of the routes that films could take beyond traditional theatrical and home video paths. I then spent more than a decade doing grassroots marketing for filmmakers like yourselves. I have always been in the independent world. It might be worth knowing also that I am originally from the United States, but am now based in Canada. The book that I published that she already mentioned is intended to be a guide that anyone can pick up and use regardless of their experience. I hope everyone will get the chance to understand what distribution is and how it works before they start sending their film out into the world so that they can use their time and money wisely. It's a curated collection of shared experience and it's not just me talking. I hope this fills some education gap since this knowledge is not regularly taught in film schools. One of the main questions that came from all of you is if I could describe the current landscape of the documentary market. Documentary distribution begins with thinking geographically because the rules for copyright and funding are different for every country. What is true in the United States is not for the rest of the world. The US doesn't have as much of a robust public television funding network as Europe has, as you might already know. Asia also works entirely differently as well. So we have to think about many landscapes and not just one. In terms of the United States, I think a lot of companies are waiting to see what studios and streamers are going to do before pro making programming decisions. If you are working in the United States as a filmmaker, I would say connect with your audiences as directly as possible, as much as possible, and not to wait on those institutions to acknowledge and fund you. Focusing on building your audience will help you in the long run, as it will show any prospective funder or partner that people are waiting to see your film. It will also help you to build a supportive network of people that will keep up with your work in the future, personally and professionally. The rest of the world will be impacted by what happens in the United States, but there is more government funding and support for export and promotion overseas. The amounts of money are not usually as high as those seen in the United States, but they still exist. So it's important to understand that Despite the chaos, there are ways for filmmakers to connect directly to audiences and make some income doing so. And that is what we are going to focus on today. If you push aside the news cycles and focus on your audiences for your film and how to reach them, you can still successfully reach some of your goals. Which brings me to the first important question you need to answer for yourself as we begin to explore the distribution landscape. What is the goal for your film? Every film has a different story. All of your decisions about how, when, and why to distribute your film will be based on what your goals are. Are you trying to push for government policy change? Are you supporting a human rights cause? Are you showcasing a funny grandparent interacting with young people to promote intergenerational understanding? Try to define some sort of specific goal to create a strategy with. It doesn't have to stay with that first goal and you can add additional ones later, but starting with a specific goal will help you to proceed. Now let's begin with a broad overview of the process of film distribution. Generally speaking, distribution is the delivery mechanism of how your film reaches an audience. The main paths of distribution are do-it-yourself, which is also known as DIY, signing with a distributor, which means that for a specific period of time, you are licensing certain rights on an exclusive basis and cannot directly sell them yourself. And then there's hybrid, 
which is a combination of DIY and working with a distributor. This is the most common practice. Filmmakers will hold back some rights that they can do well with and use a distributor for a specific right, like TV or SVOD, or a geographical region that they may not have access to. Whether you choose to work with a distributor or to do it on your own, or perhaps you are forced to do it on your own because a distributor has not picked you up, there are things you should be aware of. First, I encourage you to think about the audience you want to reach before beginning production. The audience you want to reach directly relates to the distribution paths that you research. For example, one of the impact producers I spoke with who worked with a film that dealt with single working parents suggested that you can't make people come to a screening during the week when they probably have to work. So think about who you want to see the film before you create the path that gets it to them. The status of productions varied in your registration responses. Some said they were just starting and others had completed their projects. As I speak, please consider these two questions about finding your audience. How do you think your audience consumes films and what is the best way to connect with them? Some of you asked about how to define your audience, and here are a few questions to help you figure this out. Number one, who did you make it for? Who do you feel needs to see this story? Or number two, who are the main subjects in your film? Are they family members, professional coworkers, activists? What communities do they live and work in? The answer to these questions are never, everyone. While that may be how you feel, it will help you more if you create one target group to start with and focus on, such as teachers or social workers or athletes. You can always have more groups later, but starting off with something specific is better for you to create your strategy. These questions will also help you to build release momentum. Knowing how to answer these questions will also show funders and broadcasters that there is an audience waiting for your project. As we dive into the processes of distribution, it's important to realize that the costs of your film are not over just because production is. Distribution also costs money in your time, in attending events through which you can set up professional meetings, and in creating the technical deliverables needed for getting your content out. We'll go over those details in the second half, but I just wanted you to be aware and think of them in advance. Now we'll discuss the types of markets and the strategic reasons to approach them. The markets for which distribution is most often discussed in the documentary community are theatrical, non-theatrical, home video, television, and streaming platforms. I am going to provide a brief strategic description for each so that you can understand how you might use each of these for your own purposes. Theatrical is usually handled through a distributor because it can be very costly. It involves what is called P&A or prints and advertising. It is rare for independent filmmakers to have a theatrical run. Those that do are most often seeking to participate in awards programs like the Academy Awards, which has a minimum theatrical requirement to be eligible. Sometimes producers will four wall or rent a theater to hold press screenings or publicity screenings, such as for a fundraising event. Whether you're working with a distributor or by yourself, theaters may be open to splitting box office receipts with you but expect to start off with a small percentage, like 20%. If a run lasts past two weeks, that percentage could go up. But again, it is rare and it needs to be done strategically with your end goal in mind. Theatrical documentaries are usually over one hour in length. Non-theatrical is a phrase used for culturally focused markets such as educational facilities and nonprofit groups. Educational facilities include universities and colleges and K through 12 or school systems. 
Nonprofits can be associated with social action work, but sometimes they are volunteer run professional organizations such as church groups or teachers. The unique aspect of this sector of distribution is that it is not deadline driven based. It is not like a film festival circuit where it has to be approached within the first two years. You can work with educational facilities and nonprofits for 10 years as long as it's useful. Note that sometimes educational distribution is by itself and sometimes it is lumped into non-theatrical rights in a distribution contract. It is helpful to have a version of your film that is less than one hour in length for this sector. Home video. Believe it or not, people still watch DVDs. But this also includes when you are selling your film off of downloads off of your own website. And if you have it on YouTube or iTunes, that is transactional video on demand, which also falls into this category. Television. For television, I am focusing on something called free TV. In the States, it's often called network television. So this is not about cable. Uh, I did not speak to any cable providers, so I will not pretend that this is about that. So this is about public broadcasting. This is a broadcaster that is often funded to some degree by government. Broadcasters that receive government funding are required by law to showcase their country's domestic content. As in Canada, where I am, the CBC must have a high percentage of Canadian content to maintain its license. When you're producing a documentary you intend to be seen on public television, make sure you know what the channel programs are, often called strands, and what those time slots are. Approach your local TV channel first. Once you get interest from a local station, even if it's a small city station, you can use that pitch to internationally approach, to approach international public television stations if the audience is the right match. One programmer I spoke to in Australia said that any local domestic broadcast is a launching point to other TV licenses. One important point to understand about public television is that it has a robust co-production ecosystem. This can be very helpful for filmmakers, but it requires extra paperwork and effort to see it through. One filmmaker I interviewed is based in Brazil, but frequently does co-productions with companies in Germany and Japan. These type of co-productions are facilitated by many countries that have co-production treaties that television stations rely on to get films made. It's cheaper for the stations because they aren't the only channel paying for production, and it broadens your audience by giving you another country to air your content in through your producing partner. If you do want to license your film to many different networks, prepare in post-production for each channel to have their own version to air. Each station has a different television hour based on the country and channel that you are approaching. Some leave time for commercials, some don't. PBS might be 56 minutes, but the BBC might be 48. Just as examples, I'm not saying that those are the accurate numbers, but they're different and that's what I'm trying to help you with. Always check to make sure you have the most up-to-date information. And just before we move on to online platforms, it is important to note that many television stations have a streaming service they may want to program your film on simultaneously with a film with a TV license. For instance, here the CBC has a service called GEM. And now on to online platforms, which many of you asked questions about. This is streaming, video on demand. Of course, but it's also so it, it includes AVOD or ad supported video on demand like YouTube, and it includes subscription based like the global players that you all know about. As you may already know from the news stories, global players are not buying content like they used to, and I honestly do not think that will change. When they do buy independent content, it is generally through distributors first or they might snap it up at a film festival if, it, if it's high profile enough of an event. 
I know some big streamers have gotten into funding programs like at Hot Docs here, but it is not the norm. But if you're not getting on the, the big players, there are still opportunities. It is helpful if you think about streaming from the perspective of two categories. You can find platforms that are based on genre of content, such as focusing on the environment or women. There are platforms that are dedicated to certain subjects. And then there's, you could find platforms in geographic regions that are open to showing content. There's Viaplay in Scandinavia. There are other streamers in Africa. So if you look through the, the vision, if you look through the point of view of the type of content or where it would work well, you can find other streamer options. But before you dive into finding those platforms, I want us to all go back and think strategically. Unlike the other categories of distribution that I mentioned, like theatrical, education, and public television, streamers do not usually market one particular film. Filmmakers use these platforms to highlight that people can watch their film there, but the business models of these companies are based on advertising dollars or subscription fees, not customer engagement. So make sure you understand why you are putting your content on a platform before doing so, because they are not marketing it for you. Your goal should be to use the platform to reach an intended audience. And technically speaking, just so you're aware, when you are going to streaming platforms, a lot of producers find themselves going to aggregators. These are companies that are paid a fee to do the correct file conversions so that content may be uploaded to various VOD websites. Technical deliverables, assets, and specifications can be different for every platform, and they can change over time as well. The same platform may require multiple formats to be able to deliver your content to different countries. As I wrap up this overview, I think it's useful to bring up a piece of terminology you might hear in discussions with distributors, and it also came up in your registration questions. The idea of windowing. This is when the release of a film is planned out as starting in an exhibition space, like a theater run or a festival run for a certain period of time, and then going to broadcast and then education and consumer. I was also asked to make clear what the difference between exhibition and distribution is. Ex exhibition usually means the space that a film event takes place in for the public to enjoy, be it a theater, a museum, or even virtual. Distribution is the mechanism that got it there technically and with the right deals made between the filmmaker and distributor for that space. While a traditional distribution plan usually includes a theater to TV to consumer timeline, the reality is that not every filmmaker should follow this path. Your film may not be theatrical or it may not be for an educational audience. So as you plan how to get your film out, be clear about your objective for your film so that you are not wasting or losing your time and money and realize that any type of distribution can take at least a year to execute or see any money in, whether that's through yourself directly or through a distributor. End of part one. Thank you so much, Rachel. We already have a few questions in the chat. Um, I'm not sure if you can see them, so would you prefer if I just read them out? Uh, sure. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I haven't I haven't looked at any of the questions yet in the chat. So unless um, people would like to ask their questions um, on their own, in which case you can raise your hand and Armando will unmute you. But um, yeah, that was amazing. I was ferociously taking notes here <laughs> which already. Um, but we have a question um, from Ethan Eisenberg. Um, Ethan writes, you mentioned aggregators in terms of preparing technical deliverables for streaming platforms. Are they no longer reliable to also get your film accepted into those platforms? I'm not sure I actually understand the question. Um, um, I think um, the question is, is the role of aggregators just to kind of 
technically prepare or technically prepare and also get your film placed? Um, I think it depends on the aggregator. You know, I try, so for instance, when I was writing my book, I had um, tried as a test to see if I could use Premiere to put an old film that I had done 10 years ago up on Amazon, for instance. And then Amazon, of course, stopped. Oh no, I was doing it on iTunes because Amazon was and then stopped taking independent films on their platform. Um, and so Premiere took a year and then they never did it. And so I had to cancel it after a year of not doing it. But I think it depends because I've heard that like Giant, for instance, is very good about that. But the problem is when I talk to the aggregators for my book, the platforms don't even let them know whether or not something is up there. There's no, there's no clear communication from the streamers that the content is up and when it's up. Now, there might be a couple of newer players in the field that have had better experience and I've heard there some good things about Film Hub, but the, um, the, the aggregators I spoke with said that they weren't told when something was up or not up. Is that the right question? I think so. Um, and if there have, is any need for clarification, please just uh, drop it in the chat, Armando. Oh, yes, we have a question in the audience. I'm gonna um, unmute Elaine Martin. So go ahead and ask your question. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent, thank you so much uh, for hosting this. Um, I'm learning so much. I ordered your book, by the way, I'm waiting for it to come. So my question is this, I don't know if there's an answer, but I think it's worth asking. I've realized that what some documentary filmmakers do so they can attract the attention of a distribution company, like they'll do a theatrical run, see if it could make some money and then use that, you know, to see if they can use those numbers to justify getting a deal. So my question is, given that theatrical runs are so expensive, if one books an exhibition space like a college or cultural center, and then you sell out, right? I don't know, is there like a platform like IMDB or box office where you could post the numbers or this, is this only possible through a theatrical run? I'm done, that's it. In other words, can you use any other space besides a theatrical run to get distributors attention? Is that the question? Yes, but can you but. post, is there a way to add those numbers, I guess, you know, to those to those companies that report box office numbers like uh, IMDB or box office mojo? Yeah. Um, that's a very interesting question. I, I think, so distributors might focus on different types of audiences. Okay. That, in other words, distributors might um, want, so a couple of the distributors I spoke with told me that if they, if a filmmaker came to them, for instance, and the subject was someone who had a big social media following, for instance, you could use mm. that as, as evidence that an audience exists. I don't think you need to have a theatrical run in order to create evidence that your audience exists. Um, it doesn't have to be theatrical. It could be anything. It's just usually it does help if you show a distributor that there are people waiting to see your film. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Rachel, we have um, two questions in the, um, the Q&A. Yes, I see that. You can see so, those. And then also, um, Amita, who's, whose question is also in the Q&A, um, was also asking if you could give some examples of some aggregators. So I gave some in my book, I, I, uh, uh, but I will say that I think one of the best places to look for them won't be through me. If any of you know of the, um, there's a Facebook group called Protect Yourself from Predatory Distributors and Aggregators, and they are a very active, very blunt group. And I think you should look there because I don't have um, direct experience from filmmakers telling me, oh, this one was amazing, this one was bad. Like, I prefer to give advice based on producers that I know had good experiences and I don't have that to give you. So um, I would check that group in Facebook um, to see what they say. The Facebook, it's, it's a very long name. It's protect yourself from 
uh, predatory aggregators and distributors. Um, I think you can be invited or you can just, uh, I think you, there's like 3,000 people in it. I'm trying to remember how I got in. Someone invited me. I can try to invite other people if needed, but basically they're, they're great. They're awesome. And they're very honest. So, ah, good for, yeah. So it was made, the group was started after Distriber became a nightmare and destroyed itself. So this group was created from people who were distributed through Distriber who were pissed off and wanted to share their advice. And so it's a really great group. Very honest. So we have, we have a couple questions in the Q&A and we yes. also have a hand raised. Um, maybe Armando, I'll uh, take uh, Bria's question, then we can go to um, Evo and then back to the Q&A and then maybe move on. Uh -huh. um, so um, Bria from Toronto is asking, when we identify our audiences, what concrete information ought we present for pitches and discussions? So that's a very good question, Bria, but it also depends on who it is you're trying to pitch. Every pitch is going to be different um, and every audience is going to be different. So for instance, let me try to give you a concrete example. Um, when uh, I used to be an impact producer, I worked with a lot of films that dealt with people with different abilities. Uh, there was a, a, a woman that we chronicled going to Congress to fight for rights for people with disabilities. She had Down syndrome. I think I'm starting to talk too fast. I'm sorry, I'll slow down. Uh, and so we, whenever anything was involved with creating partnerships for her, it was always based on the lens of self-advocacy, how to help forward people, the rights of people with disabilities. And then we would get rehabilitation centers involved. We would get um, government uh, services involved. So it, it depends on the audience, but it's usually amount of time, um, what you want to talk about, what's your goal, and and always leave room for whoever you want to partner with to or pitch to to ask questions, uh, because then you'll get to know what information is important to them as well. Oh, good. I'm glad it's easy to join that Facebook group. It's very useful. Um, um, so another question, um, Armando, would we like to mm -hmm. go to Evo now in the um, audience with the hand raise? Yeah, Evo, I'm going to let you speak now. Hello? We hear you. Hi, hi, everybody. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for this, you know, this great opportunity and Rachel, very nice to meet you. And thank you for your, your, you know, your input and the book and everything. Um, so the question is, uh, as a filmmaker, you know, you, you sometimes have to talk about distribution with whoever wants to help you. And I've heard a lot of, of, of there's been a lot of, of, of news about filmmakers not being able to do, make good deals. You know, they always get screwed over or whatever because they're not prepared. So in this case, when you have to approach a deal like this, what are the, what are, what are key financial deal points that pertain the most to a filmmaker, you know? Uh, uh, that that should be included on a deal agreement. You know, what are the things you have to look out for that we have to discuss for our own benefit? That you know, so this won't happen again. Or be within the distribution contract, is that oh, what yeah, you're asking? The, yeah, when a distribution contract. What are the key financial deal points that you have to be clear about, and you have to make sure they they benefit you? You know, how to, how to identify those, or you know, terminology, or you know, rates, or mm -hmm. you know, terms. um, so. Uh, when you're looking at a distribution contract, this is going to be in part two in a few minutes, but I'll also start explaining now. The first thing you do before you even, I mean, if you're, if you're given an offer by a distributor, the first thing I would do is start vetting the distributor to make sure that they're reliable before even trying to look at their contract. I would go onto that Facebook group and see if anybody has heard of them, if anybody has positive experience. I would go on the D word and see if anybody there has experience. It, I would look through their website to make sure that you have, that that distributor has, has done work with films like yours. Um, so once you know that they're solid, 
then you can kind of make sure that the contract makes sense. I do uh, uh, find that a couple of things to look out for with the contracts are expenses and that there's a cap on expenses. Um, one of the things I suggest to all filmmakers is that they do uh, their own post-production technical deliverables, which we'll be talking about in a minute, um, and not to necessarily allow the distributor to, because at the end of the contract, distributors usually destroy and that's all that work that goes to waste so you might as well have it yourself and also look out for uh, auto renewal clauses if there's anything that says that at the end of the term it will automatically renew because you want to be able to have a conversation again if you are not thrilled or to move on all right um but I'll go over more distribution and sales yes, stuff in a please. minute. I was looking more for the other financial, but yeah, that's I understand. I understand. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe we have time for a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. um, these are a little, maybe you can answer uh, Rachel uh, pretty briefly, really kind of, maybe this is a yes, no question. Um, there's a like praise that you know so much from Amita. And um, do you ever con consult with producers on how to place their film? Do you do consultant work in that way? I do, my concern, and I used to do that a lot, um, but my concern is more that I'm trying to work more through organizations to help filmmakers because I really don't wanna charge filmmakers more than they already get charged for things. So that's my goal, but yes, I do. I would never turn down helping a filmmaker out, but I just, you know, I, I don't like charging filmmakers directly for my work, so. That's great, thank you. Um, and another question, um, kind of following up on Alain's question, can laurels um, from festivals help when talking to distributors and regarding an audi the audience? So I don't necessarily think the laurels matter to distributors. Um, the distributors I talk to are looking at films through the lens of who their clients are, which are usually TV and streaming and stuff like that in different countries. And the laurels are more personal filmmaker, professional kind of credit than they are for selling a film in the marketplace. This is what I have found. Um, you know, in a way um, it, it's good for you because it looks professional in the documentary community but it doesn't necessarily matter for a television broadcast in another country. Great. Um, Rachel, do you want to um, move on? And we have a few questions in the chat as well. We also have a question about how do you choose a great impact producer, but maybe we can pin. Yeah, let me, I'll go, <laughs> yeah I'm going to go into the second part first because I think it'll help inform maybe a little bit more, but we can discuss impact producers afterwards if you'd like, but I'm going to go into the second um, section of what I've written and it's very detailed, so I'm going to go slow, but I am going to be reading the whole time once again, just so you know. So part two. Having provided a general overview of the markets that you'll be trying to get your film into, it's important to define one underlying term that impacts them all, exclusivity. Exclusive means that you cannot sell that right to someone else, whether you are doing it or you have a distributor doing it. If you've given up your non-theatrical rights in North America to a U.S. distributor, you cannot sell your film to a university there if you are asked. You give the sale to the distributor to fulfill for you and then watch for it in your royalties at your next reporting cycle. If a television station funds your film and asks for the premiere broadcast, you cannot sell that film to someone else before that broadcast takes place. Exclusive license fees are often higher than non-exclusive because they are paying to be the sole source of that content. Exclusive sales tend to happen at the beginning of a film's run in the marketplace. Non-exclusive means you can sell the same right to however many clients you want, and there are a lot of these type of deals in streaming and in television. Non-exclusive licensing helps because it saves them money because it costs them less to pay for your film. And you can make more sales because you can keep licensing it. 
but it does take more time and follow-up work. Another important definition to make before proceeding to discuss working with companies is to explain the difference between a sales agent and a distributor. Sales agents work on commission. They usually set up a shorter term for a contract and they only get paid if they make a sale of your film. They may ask for exclusivity for that period and for a geographic region. The commission that they keep can run between 20 to 40%. The main difference between sales agents and distributors is that sales agents usually don't ask to keep your rights, but they are simply asking for the right to sell your work. Distributors are companies that usually sign you to a contract for some or all of the rights to your film for a minimum of five to seven years. Sometimes they provide an advance or MG, which is also a minimum guarantee. They provide royalty reports annually or every six months. The royalty you receive based off the gross price of a sale is usually in the 20 to 60% range. Distributors may do both exclusive and non-exclusive deals depending on their business model. If they just want to have the largest catalog possible, non-exclusive may suffice. If they want to be known for specific content in a particular region, they may demand exclusivity. If there are markets, such as non-theatrical, that you think you could do some successful outreach work in, try to see if you can hold those rights or share them non-exclusively. Choose a distribution path that feels right for your film. Some personal considerations to think about when trying to decide about working with a distributor or not. It can make sense to sign with a distributor because distribution is a lot of work. It is its own full-time job. You may not want to be doing the outreach work or have the ability to hire someone to do it for you. And you may be working on your next project. These are all reasons to go with a distributor. And if they have a good reputation and an established connection to a targeted audience, a distributor can be a great partner. Do not be afraid to ask them questions. And if the answers aren't clear, ask again. Be sure there's good communication. Contracts with distributors generally last between up to seven, even 10 years. So you want a good fit. Get a lawyer to look at any contract before you sign. Check for expenses that they say they can recoup and ask for a cap on expenses. Look at what the renewal terms are. Make sure there are no auto renewal clauses if you want to be able to reconsider the relationship in the future. There may be other details that impact your long-term goals. It is important to understand that there may not be the right distributor for your film out there, or the right distributor may not have the staff or space on their slate for your film. Don't try to push a match that doesn't make sense. Not having the right distribution company that fits your film is why hybrid happens. When you are considering distributors, vet them before signing anything by looking at their website to make sure that they have handled content like yours. Find a few films that are similar to your film on their website and reach out to the filmmakers to get feedback on the distributor. You'll get even more insight if you look for a film on their site that is at least three years old because the process of distribution takes a year or two and it helps provide a longer term idea of whether or not that distributor has given, has had enough opportunity that they've helped that film. Check out the film, the distributor that you're looking at, check them out with local film organizations such as Women in Film or places like the D Word and the Protect Yourself From Facebook group that I just mentioned to see if anyone has worked with them. Distributors are supposed to regularly attend events and conferences. Ask which events they go to, how they prepare, and what to expect. Ask which markets they focus on. If they don't focus on one and you want to focus on that, 
you make sure you can keep it and find another path. Uh, meaning whether if, you, if they do educational, if they don't, if they do home video, if they don't, if they don't do those ones, you keep them and find another way to make it fruitful for you. Ask the distributor for their technical deliverables. Some deliverables are universally wanted from all markets, such as closed captioning. Distributors usually have a standard list of what they need from producers in order to add you to their catalog. These deliverables can be costly, and there are clauses in most contracts related to expenses. Again, see if there's a cap or not. This comes up a lot as a form of stress, so that's why I keep repeating it. You may be able to work with a post-production house to do some of your own deliverables so that the files are yours and not the distributors. Because at the end of these contracts, as I already mentioned, they, it'll be destroyed and it'll be a waste. Um, having discussed sort of what distributors uh, might do with you, I'm going to discuss where you find them. I know this was a common question in the registration uh, questions. So, most people find distributors and sales agents at festivals, markets, forums, and other professional development events. I dedicated a whole chapter of my book into the documentary ecosystem because that ecosystem is where people congregate and socialize and build their network. The IDA is listed in that chapter. It is helpful to be aware that there is a whole industry plugging away that you can connect with. Documentary events and organizations are useful because they are epicenters of activity. They are attended by every part of the documentary industry, TV execs, press, distributors, and funding agencies. These programs are the main arena for industry to share best practices, current struggles, and latest research. So you'll be making connections, but also learning about trends in the industry. These Events, like distributors, have a brand that industry representatives instantly know and trust, such as being at Hot Docs. Getting programmed increases the visibility of a film, which also increases the value in the marketplace and promotes sales, but you don't necessarily have to have had a finished film. There are different events for different parts of the production cycle. Also use local membership organizations to reach others. For instance, being a member of Women in Film in one city means you get promoted when your film plays in another city. Use opportunities to get involved in the production or marketing of films before reaching out to distributors, such as through workshops. The D word, which is free to join, has been doing weekly face-to-face -face Zoom meetings since COVID and actively allows people to promote their work and share peer support. This type of early engagement can have a strong impact on helping a film to get out to a more diverse professional event uh, environment. And festivals and markets and forums are also places where people find co-producing partners. One producer I wrote, uh, I worked with said she budgets to attend at least three of the same events every year through which she has met European and Asian co-producers that she's worked with for over a decade. I was repeatedly told by industry personnel that it is useful to show up to whatever local festival or event that you could, even if you did not have a project that was screening. It shows a level of professionalism that you keep showing up and you may find partners for a project while you are still in development. Some strategic thoughts on attending or using an events platform to connect with the industry at these events. Each documentary event may focus on a different part of production such as development or post-production and finishing funds. The earlier you are able to begin participating, the better you do not have to wait until you are finished with your film to join. In fact, the trend of funders and distributors getting involved in films before they are complete is increasing. But do your research before you sign up, because these can be very costly, to make sure that the right funders and distributors are attending. 
Sometimes you may be even able to write people that you'd want to connect with, even if you or they can't attend. I was speaking at Hot Docs and wrote to every funder who was listed in their online community to ask them if they would consider programming distribution training for their filmmakers. I have had some success from this and only about half of the people that I reached out to were actually at the festival. Travel is hard and expensive for everyone, not just independent filmmakers. Most importantly, when you reach out for a quick introduction chat, make sure the person you are seeking to meet and connect with makes sense for the content that you are making. The biggest complaint I heard from industry representatives was that filmmakers would come to a meeting with a project that would never get aired on their station or that they just would not handle. They felt filmmakers did not bother to look at their website before pitching to them. Do your research first to make sure that the industry personnel normally fund or distribute the content that you are making. If you have done your homework, even if they say no the first time, they, you will look better for the next time that you approach them. Be prepared when you are going to events or reaching out to people for events to have a few must haves ready with you. Have a budget, include production, post-production and outreach ideas. Anything you can associate with a cost is worth keeping track of. It makes you look professional. Anyone that you wanna partner with, whether it's a funder or a broadcaster, is going to ask to look at your budget. Understand that there will be a list of technical deliverables. I know I've already said it a few times, and, but these deliverables will vary based on market and end user. Television has one set of deliverables and video on demand has another, and these can also change. You may, you may have heard of this one already from other places, but I have to repeat it because it's one of the biggest mistakes filmmakers make. Have release forms for any people, music, and art that appear on camera in your film. These forms may be asked for during the process of securing errors and omissions insurance, and it may be needed if you approach other countries as well. Subtitles and closed captions. This goes under the deliverables uh, department. Make sure you always have English subtitles, even if your subjects speak English. This is actually advice from a sales agent who knew I was doing this talk and wanted to be helpful. They said that there are so many accents, it is best to make sure anyone can understand what is being said. It is also helpful when they are big in yellow or in shadow so that they can definitely be read. Too many times people use white and then when the text is on a light background, no decision maker can see anything. Caption files are also used for other reasons, so it is good to have them done through a post house. TV requires them and some public educational facilities require them because they cannot buy contact that content that doesn't have accessibility elements. We know accessibility is super important for everyone. Everybody uses this. Caption files, sorry, okay. Once you are involved in any event or a program, use every success and development to build your audience. Here are some ideas of how each market can facilitate that. Develop an email list or newsletter based on what is happening in your subject or field. If any of your subjects are part of a community or academic organization, use those connections. Ask if their newsletters would talk about your subject being filmed, for instance. Every connection with an audience is good for you to show your work matters and that you are organized and professional. Some filmmakers I talked to got letters of support from these groups and showed them to funders and distributors to show that there was interest and partnerships in place. On the educational front, you can promote your films and build audience related to key themes that everyone can relate to during the year, such as Black History Month, Women's History Month, and key holidays like Veterans Day. For public broadcast, even though you won't necessarily have access directly to who has watched or what the audience level is, 
you can create more of an audience by promoting your broadcasts. The great thing about public television, even though the amount of the license fee is not as high as you might want, is that it is an invaluable seal of approval you can use to expand your distribution network. Use every broadcast as a launching point. If you have an airtime or date, send out emails to educational departments and subject librarians at universities to suggest they watch it and offer to send them a secure link to preview if they can't. They may not be able to do it right then, but it provides an opportunity to expand your audience list. You can also send broadcast information emails to nonprofit groups to suggest that they watch or consider a screening for their organizations with speakers and your subjects. Uh, it is important to know that, tele I think I mentioned this before, but just a slight reiteration, many television stations have a streaming component to their service offerings. This is often called tethering. So here CBC has GEM and that can also be used for previewing purposes. Be sure when you're planning post-production that you consider preparing several versions of your content. Make a version for this TV station or that TV station. Also create shorter versions for classroom use if it makes sense. One producer I interviewed in Australia was ver said that versioning was the key to her success. She made a theatrical version of her film a 15 minute version for North American classrooms while partnering with a distributor there, a 40 minute version for local nonprofit groups. And of course, there was a TV hour for her local public broadcaster. In working with professional organizations, you can also have your subject with the film and a professional organization such as the National Association of Social Workers. So you can use different forms of your distribution path to continually market your content based on how it is already currently in use. As I start to wind down from overwhelming you with a bunch of specifics, I'm going to return to giving you some overall professional advice on getting out into the world. It will help you to keep these things in mind when you start reaching out to members of the documentary community. Always be honest. Documentary is a very small world and everyone talks to each other. When you don't know something and you admit it, you are more likely to find help if you ask questions than if you pretend to know something and are found out not to. Have good key art, posters, and high quality photos for your film readily available. Do not ever try to use screenshots. There are probably communities that can relate to your film outside of your home country. It is worth connecting with them. One of the filmmakers I met while virtually attending the international, the IDA's Get Real conference in 2020 is originally from Pakistan. She made a film about women in unconventional jobs called Showgirls of Pakistan. That film is now being screened at universities across the United States through a distributor there. It has also been aired on Vice TV internationally. Watching these women work as dancers or other performers and struggle to participate in normal society is simply compelling no matter what country you are from. But realize that different countries have different technical requirements, government regulations, and funding mechanisms. So when you're trying to approach other countries, look out, look to reach out for a local documentary organization for guidance. Check the D word. For example, when I grew up, I grew up in the United States and now I live in Canada. Even though the two countries are right next to each other, their industries work completely differently. Chapter three of my book included these organizations and events throughout the calendar year. While I encourage everyone to think globally, you should be aware that your audience is not everyone in the world, and that is okay. Pick the best first group to target and see how your connections build. If you can't identify a group based on what your film is about, think about what type of people you want the film to reach and choose a group 
such as nurses or sports enthusiasts. Once you identify this audience, find out how they consume content. Realize that all distribution work, whether you do it by yourself or you place it with a distributor, will take time, sometimes a few years, before any income is seen. It takes time for content to circulate the marketplace and gain traction. Understand that there is an entire documentary system out there waiting. You are not starting it all from scratch, scratch. So good luck, ask a lot of questions and focus on what is most effective for you and your film. End of part two. No, I'm not reading excerpts from my film. I write the speech in advance so that I know what it is I'm trying to say to you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, so we'll just um, have time for people. We've got about a half an hour still left for Q&A um, to really dive into anything that was brought up in part two or, um, or yeah, kind of revisit things from part one. Absolutely. So I see that um, Alan has his hand raised. So um, maybe Armando, if we could unmute yes. and get that question. Mm -hmm. All right, going to let you speak now. All right, it's me again. Sorry, the annoying student in class. No, no, no. Um, let me just say, Rachel, that was just really inspiring and outright phenomenal. I cannot wait for that book to arrive, man. I thank you for that. Thank you, seriously. Um, so, a quick question I had for you was, I know that, you know distributors like to see like you got press of course as you know if you want to have a twenty thousand dollar publicist you can't get it in the new york times or the post so i'm i've had some success getting on local stations right so i'm wondering will that make a dent for me eventually that's it local tv stations no local radio stations local radio well, absolutely, yeah. everything is helpful. You you have the ability to make everything helpful for you. I would take everything that you have done and I would copy and comment and use it to ask someone else for the same thing. Okay. You know, every, every sp talk I've done about distribution is almost entirely based on the fact that I've done it before, right? And I, right. so, use everything reuse everything absolutely and the other thing which i didn't mention but i think it's important is you may reach out to someone and not hear again and that happens sometimes it's really just because people are busy and their inboxes get full there are people that i've done uh speaking events for that i had to write two or three times to make it happen but it did so don't always expect that the first time you're going to get an answer if you think it's the right target for what you're doing, I would write again in three months time and say, this is an update, just wondering if this is something that you would program. Got it. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And we do have a question from Megan as well, but I wanted to kind of um, piggybacking a little bit on what Alan said. And I know Rachel, this is something you have, I, and I have talked about, but you spoke about kind of thinking about different audiences. But I think also one thing that wasn't brought up directly is also as a filmmaker, figuring out what success or what the different types of success look yeah. like for you, right? Because those are, there's so many different ways that we can measure our success or the success of our film. I don't know if you wanted to add anything about that. Well, so that's a good point. It's kind of, it goes to the point of what is your goal and so you create the what create one goal of i want to get pro i want every nursing school to program this film and then once you have that goal then you have to sit there and define for yourself well how will i know that i've been successful in doing that is it getting programmed at an annual conference is it getting uh, accepted as part of curriculum at universities is it so you define what a goal and then you figure out how you feel like you could be successful in reaching that goal. Um, and this way, the more specific you are, the easier it is for you to figure out 
how to proceed. Um, Thank you. No, thanks for that. Um, Does that make sense? Did that answer your question? Yeah, that makes sense. I think also um, one thing I was thinking about is about being responsive. And like you were saying, like it can be really um, overwhelming to be interacting with the industry and getting rejected. And, you know, I think that all films have some level of success that they can reach, even if it's just like hyper local screenings. So how do you create success for your film, even though it might not be like this level that maybe was your initial goal when you were starting out? How can you make your goals responsive as you see how your film is working in the world, you know? So yeah. trying to like, don't get discouraged kind of situation. But well, also um, it's okay to do small ones too. You don't have to, I mean, there are, there can be points like little milestones. It doesn't have to be the whole thing that you accomplish. Like trying to do things in chunks is a lot more yeah. helpful. <laughs> Um, Megan, you have a question. I see your hand raised. Thanks for waiting. Um, did you want to, Armando, could we unmute Megan and yes. uh, they can ask their question? Yeah. Hi, yes, thank you so much. First of all, thank you, IDA, for hosting this. And Rachel, thank you so much. I'm ferociously taking notes, as I'm sure everyone is. Um, uh, we are actually in the research phase of our distribution, so the timing of this is just fantastic. Um, and thank you for your experience. This gives us agency as filmmakers. Um, my question for you is specific to public television within the United States. Our film, our documentary, is a co-production, and it's actually taking place in Mexico, the narrative. As far as your understanding, I understandably public television is the percentage is probably most most interested in domestic stories. Do you have an understanding if we bring them an international story, what kind of percentage of those stories they take on? You mean how much the U.S. takes Mexico stories? Uh, what I'm trying to say is. Um, Public television within the United States, I imagine they predominantly want to tell domestic stories. Do you know how many international stories they want to share? Um, so the public television stations that I talk to in the US, so it's mainly, you know, the PBS system, right? Mm -hmm. And they end up working on a very hyper local level for the most part. Okay. Um, the people I, main people I talked to at PBS were uh, based on out of the WGBH office, which was in Boston. Mm -hmm. And each channel kind of has its own way of working. So I'm not sure I could say a broad blanket statement that nobody would, but you know, if you're talking about, but I do think there are, areas that have higher levels, for instance, of diverse communities and that they would program international because their communities are diverse. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, I think they would, but I think in a way you almost have to give them why it's local and makes sense for them. Right. Does that make sense? No, that's right. Yes. Thank you for clarifying. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thanks, Megan. And we do, Rachel, um, I don't know, Rachel, if you click at the bottom, you can see the Q&A. Yes, um, I see three there, right now. Yeah, there are three questions. So I just want to give you, you know, for you, feel free to answer those in whatever order you feel makes sense. Um, I don't personally necessarily recommend any distributor or not. I go based on whether, uh, sorry, Claire, uh, your question about recommending a specific distributor for gender equity focused uh, documentaries. Um, I think there, I think Women Make Movies is the big one in the United States. Um, I think that in a, you'd still have to vet anybody you're going after. Um, I, I haven't personally been distributed by a distributor, so I don't want to give you incorrect advice, but uh, basically um, you would like, I would research the ones that have made films similar to what you're going for. Um, when creating, very, Anthony asks, when creating and using various versions of your project, are distributors going to have issues with giving exclusive rights for territories or windows? So I, uh, they may, they may not. What you're signing up with for a distributor is usually one version of your film. If they have a problem with you making more than one, I think you should work it out with them. And I think they should let you because the more 
that the content is out there, the better it is for everyone. Um, there is one tidbit a lawyer gave me, although they would not let me quote them, but uh, they were saying that when you're talking with a distributor, you should also ask for an ask tell schedule. This is a schedule that basically says that you both agree on a minimum amount of a sale in order for them to accept it, because sometimes distributors want a certain level before they will go through. Um, that I know that's not directly from the question you just asked, but it was a good piece of advice that I wanted to share. But I feel like if a distributor wants your film to succeed, they should let you make it succeed in any way that you can. The people that I know that do versioning have distributors and also have different versions, so I don't think it's impossible. And if the distributor is giving you junk, then maybe you shouldn't work with them. <laughs> okay, Seth, as we all know, things are changing rapidly. I imagine since you finished your book, there might be things that you might include in a later version. Is there anything that has changed since you wrote your book? And there's also the issue of AI. Uh, how, anything you would advise on the AI issue? So I know nothing about AI. So I'm not going to advise you because I don't know anything about it. I have heard there was a D word face-to-face uh, -face session on it a few weeks ago. You might be able to find it on their YouTube platform because some filmmakers in the D word were using AI to help with um, like captioning and translation and uh, transcription is the word I'm looking for. Um, the problem is you still have to fact and grammar check everything because there are so many language problems and so many culturally inappropriate language problems with AI that even if you use it, this is what I've heard, I have not used it directly, even if you use it, you still may be doubling the work by having to fix it afterwards. As for what has changed since I wrote my book, the biggest chapter that has changed is chapter four, which was on streaming, because several streamers stopped doing what they were doing while I was writing it. I was trying to get my film on Amazon, and then they stopped taking independence. Um, Vimeo went from being an affordable platform where people could host things to increasing their rates by like 100% or something crazy. So basically all the streaming stuff has changed, which is why I said that you should focus on geography and on um, content type and theme instead of just broad streaming platforms. Okay, Bria, what are the ballpark ranges for a that what a distributor will pay for a documentary? If you're talking about an MG or an advance, I'm going to actually say I think it's better to not take an advance or an MG than it is to take it. This is my personal opinion. I say this because, for instance, I'll give you an example of my book. So my book, I was given an advance for, and then I will get a 6% royalty rate once a year. That advance, I have to, in order to get that advance back, I have to make up enough sales to get 6% equaling $500 in order to get any sort of royalties. So the problem with MGs and advances is that that may be the only money you get. And if they have the film for years, you're gonna lose out on a lot of income. That is my personal opinion. So I don't necessarily think that distributors are paying these anymore at the moment. But if they are, I would actually go more towards getting a higher royalty percentage as opposed to getting an MG or an advance. Uh, ask tell information. Yeah, that lawyer, the lawyer who told me that told me not to let me, anybody know what their name was because they didn't want to get in trouble. <laughs> If I could also chime in on the MG question, um, I would say that, you know, the um, the range, right, could be as, as little as zero um, and you just work off of a split or off of, and again, this is where those expenses come in. Um, is the distributor going to 
take your marketing expenses off the top. And in that case, it'll be a long time before you see a recoup. Um, there's also something you can ask for that a lot of filmmakers don't know is you can ask for first monies. So in lieu of an MG right up front, you can ask for a percentage of the first monies before the distributor takes a cut once they start making sales. So that's something that for like smaller distributors and smaller projects could be useful. Never heard of that. You just taught me something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so ask tell schedule is um, when you and the distributor agree on a minimum level of sale that they will say yes to in order to sell your film. So for instance, uh, one of the filmmakers I talked with was with a distributor that is no longer alive. Uh, the distributor is is uh, is bankrupt. In other words, the filmmaker's alive. Anyway, um, she that distributor first got her film on Netflix like ten years ago. When Netflix came back to relicense it, the distributor did not think it was enough money, and they said no. So my filmmaker was really angry about that because she wanted to be able to tell people it was there. So that is why an ask tell schedule would be useful. We have a question in the chat. Uh, what are the pros cons of self distributing on via on demand platform like Vimeo or YouTube instead of finding a streaming distributor? So that is an excellent question. I kind of like to go back to the idea of why you are putting it on streaming. I think you have to focus on which audience you want to target with it first. Um, and then, um, I mean, from what I know, Vimeo is really expensive now, but um, the pros of going with a distributor are that they are reaching, they technically can reach an audience that you may not be able to. The difficulty is that they're not promoting just your film. So even if your film is on the distribution streaming platform, you will have to promote that it is there. The pros of doing it yourself are that you have access to all the data and information and contacts. The problem is it's a lot of work. So it's, um, it's kind of that that's a, uh, I know that also YouTube, when you're at a certain level of subscribers and viewing hours, they start giving you some ad money, but that ad money is very, very small and it may or may not be worth it. I think it's like 0 0.001 cent per, <laughs> you know, so be aware that, you know, it's, it's important to know why you're going on the streaming service that you're going. I personally think it should be to connect directly with an audience that you want to connect with that you wouldn't otherwise. No, we have a question and I think this is a really um, great question in the, in the Q and A um, about, um, you know, you mentioned most people find distributors and sales agents at festivals. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear your recommendation recommendations on what types of events, tracks, et cetera, to look for at festivals? Um, what should we be seeking and signing up for when we go? So there's a lot of festivals that operate uh, professional development events or and pitch forums. Um, there are ones that create meetings. Uh, I know Hot Docs is one. Um, there, so organizations that have something beyond just screenings and development, um, but it again can go back to the kind of content, right? So for instance, one of the events that I loved, but is not necessarily for every kind of content was an event called the World Congress of Science and Factual Producers. And they are a science, they're science documentaries. Um, and so, a lot of public television stations go. It's a very collegial atmosphere. They have panels about what they've done um, and they're very social, but that's very science-based. So it has to be your film or work should be about 
science or history or engineering or those type of contents. If it's more social action, it might be more hot dogs. It might be more of a different event. So it, it, it depends on your type of content. And then based on your type of content, I would find or focus on events that develop filmmakers professionally. I do have a list of events in my book, but I, I'm trying to think, is there a way, Keisha and I talked beforehand about maybe me sending some documentation to her afterwards. Well, we can discuss that. I'm only allowed to share a certain percentage of my book with <laughs> laws. <laughs> I would, I would also add, um, just in terms of the festivals question, because this is something at IDA and the funds department that we do a lot, we go around and have one on one meetings with people at festivals. Um, so your project can be officially accepted into the festival, which is one thing in which case the festival and the industry attendees will be matchmaking, but you can also be outside of the festival and as Rachel mentioned, you can have access to industry people and then you can like try to connect with them outside of that even at a festival those social hours are also really great places to connect with people and usually everyone is invited to those so yeah we've got two more questions we're running a little bit toward the end of time so we've got two more questions rachel i hope you can answer before yeah, we absolutely time. absolutely i'm glad to answer as many questions as i can um, in setting up expectations for money and return, where can I find transparent metrics of what documentary sales look like? I, there is no such thing that I'm aware of. If there is, I would love to find out. I really, I, I don't think there is. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I honestly have no idea how to answer that question. I don't know if you can set up expectations for money and return. <laughs> um, I would say you can set up a budget for what you want to do. Like you want to go to this event, so that'll cost you this much money. And these are the things you're gonna do when you're there. Um, but I don't think that there are any, are you aware of any Keisha? Maybe you know, I, I'm not aware of any. It's something that we're also trying to change. I mean, one of the issues with distribution and all of this is that, you know, the mystery of it all. And the like the, the the lack of transparency around these things that this attendee is asking about, about numbers, about sales, about that. And I think if we can find a way to better share this information, and I'm seeing some thing about that in the chat, that would be great. But yeah, right now I don't really know of any place. Though um the final piece of this um question about asking festivals for screening fees, this is one way where laurels can come in useful, I think, because if you do have a strong premiere or a track record of like bringing people to your screenings, um, definitely, you know, the worst thing a festival can do is say no, and it's worth worth your while to ask for screening fees for sure. Yeah, they should get used to people asking for money for their work anyway, <laughs> right? Um, as a documentary filmmaker, it is really difficult to involve distributors, especially if you're not known. At what stage do you involve a distributor? And if we don't find one, is it advisable to go ahead with the project or wait until we get one? What kinds of distributors do we focus on, local or international? So I it used to be the, the wisdom was you finish and then you send things to distributors, but distributors are now getting involved before the end of production. And part of the reason is, is that a lot of financing is usually in place before it gets to distribution, either because a filmmaker has got a funder involved or because they have a television broadcast. So it is actually better for you if you do get distributors involved before you're finished. And that has been a big change over the past, I'd say 20 years. If you do not find one, I do think you go ahead with the project and you move on. The more you build up for yourself, the easier it'll be for you later on. If you wait, it may never happen. And then you are then all of your hard work and your care is lost. So I don't think you wait. I think you keep going and building what you can. As for what kind of distributor to focus on, whether it's local or international, that is entirely based on your film. Your film may be a very localized story or it may be international. I'd have to know what kind of film it is before knowing what kind of distributor to reach out to. Mm -hmm. 
I agree with you, Cheryl. <laughs> a lot of people agree with you, Cheryl. <laughs> Um, just as everyone could see the chat, maybe, but um, Cheryl's saying, I also feel like paying to participate in a festival when I've invested in the film, then not getting any of the box office and competing for a best of award is oppressive. And I think that mm -hmm. these, um, I mean, this is something that I think we have to start speaking to festivals and speaking to decision makers and, you know, um, making these voices heard so that we can, we can shift things. Um, Rachel, I'm wondering if there are any any last words that you have? I also just want to offer that, you know, we're also happy to continue to take questions afterwards. So, you know, let's think of this uh, webinar as a beginning and not an end. And if there's a follow-up that needs to happen um, in some time, we can definitely arrange for that too and ask Rachel to come back and join us or maybe even have a, a, a broader panel based on your questions. But um, Rachel, any final thoughts or um, kind of remarks? I think just be a good person. I mean, I know it sounds really simple and naive, but you know, I, the documentary community, I said, be honest, but it's also, you gotta be good. Everybody should be good to each other because that's the way things get done. And that's kind of one of the beautiful things I've always enjoyed about the documentary community is that for the most part, everyone wants to help each other and we should all keep it that way. Yes, Claire, I am on LinkedIn. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, great. Thank you so much, Rachel. I also wanted to just add, again, I'm like piggybacking on everyone's comments, but I think it's really important for those of you who are filmmakers to understand that you have power and that you can demand um, a relationship that feels good for you with your distributor. There's no reason. I feel a lot of people go into these relationships thinking, you know, I'm in the weak bargaining position. I need to just take whatever their attitude is, do whatever they say. But that's just, if that's the way you're starting off, it's not going to be a great experience. So yeah, just hold your power for sure. Um, so if we could all just, you know, give thanks to Rachel and again, we'll keep these conversations going, keep your questions coming and we'll try to get you something of a one sheet. Rachel and I will talk about it afterwards to see what we can um, send out to those of you who are registered for this webinar. Um, and I think, I think that's what we've got. Thanks so much, everyone. Really appreciate having me. Thank you so much, Rachel. This was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you.